Good afternoon, everyone. This is the last lecture of the series. So, and it's about uh, extending the Dempster Shepherd classifier model that we were reviewing from in these uh, previous lectures to other applications, like other problems, other tasks, and other, uh, and other use cases. Yeah, uh, well, you know me, I'm Sergio Benafiel. <laughs> Uh, and today we will be reviewing the classifier that we see in the series, but also um, showing you the limitations that it has, because uh, as uh, um, we are being, uh, been talking about the good of the classifier, the interpretability and all of these things, but the classifier has many drawbacks that we will uh, need to address to, to make it better. And then we will be uh, seeing how to use this uh, dempster sheffer like theory to uh, apply to solve regression tasks. We will see two different models that we have been developed um, in this line. We will be uh, reviewing also the uh, dempster sheffer um, classifier in geographical scenarios where you have coordinates with latitude and longitude. And finally, we'll be um, reviewing how to use them search effort to combine any model, yeah. right? Which, uh, so um, in this uh, series, we propose a model that is a classification model that use uh, the them search effort theory uh, uh, and gradient design optimization for the mass values. It's a rule-based model who has many highlights, as you can see there, like the optimization using gradient descent, the uh, ability to have interpretability, a global interpretable results, um, and accuracy uh, comparable to other machine uh, learning classifiers, not the best, not the worst, right? And the ability to input uh, expert knowledge as rules in the model is another highlight. One of the most important ones is the, uh, that the model can handle missing values, which is uh, uh, not so common in other models, like artificial neural network, for example. And uh, you can handle missing values with this model like in the, uh, in the beginning. And it uh, can be, be applied to any tabular data set, right? This is the highlights, the pros of the model, but, and I, and in this chart that I showed you before, we are in this uh, section uh, in the highly interpretable um, group of models and with an accuracy comparable to, I don't know, a super vector machine or a K nearest neighbor, right there. But as I said, the model has drawbacks, right? And the main uh, drawbacks or limitation of the models are listed here. Um, one is about the dempster sheffer um, implementation that we use, that I showed you in the last lecture also, that uncertainty is simplified to one value, right? You can have many different combinations of uh, the outcome of masses that the theory proposes to, um, to use as mass, uh, but we are only using one uncertainty for the mass assigned function. That is a limitation because we don't have the full expressibility of the dempster sheffer theory, but uh, we uh, do this because of performance mainly, Be because if you have the full uh, subset uh, array of masses, you have exponential length computations in every step, and this is very expensive, yeah. Um, also, the second drawback that is one of the most important ones, I, I think, um, is that rules are defined in the beginning of the model, before the training, and uh, the model itself doesn't uh, learn the rules, right? It, it adjusts the values of the rules, said which rules are important and which are not, but the model cannot produce rules. You have to uh, set up the uh, rules in the beginning, and this is a huge limitation because uh, you are constrained to what you put in the rules, and 
Uh, in some cases, that is okay, but in other cases, you uh, will would like to have a more um, a automatic way of finding these these rules. Um, this is something that we need to improve to make a fully automatically model <laughs> in, for that. But uh, today is one of the main limitations of the model. Yeah. The third one is related to the first one. Uh, that the model is uh, slow, right? You you see in the in the in the implementation that we tried to do in the last lecture that even a simple model with eight rules uh, took a lot of time to train, right? You, when you when we ran the cell of training the for loop, uh, it took like a minute or two for a data set that has a hundred of records, and if you have like uh, hundreds of thousands of records or millions of records. Uh, this is super slow. This took, uh, start to took hours or days to train. So uh, it's important to address this problem uh, of performance, of making computation faster. And we have applied some tricks, some numerical, for example, uh, simplifications of the operation that the model uh, does internally, but that is not enough, and we think we can uh, find new ways to compute the, the same rules uh, with less resource, right? So this is another uh, thing that can be improved. Um, the fourth is that uh, rules define hard boundaries for records. That, what I mean with that is that if you have a rule, for example, that says that some attributes have to be greater than 20 or any value, right? If you have a record with the value of 20, it gets the rule, right? But if you have a record with a value of 19.999, uh, this uh, rule doesn't apply for that. So it's a, like a, a huge step. Uh, it's not a soft transition between uh, applying one rule and not applying one rule. So this is a problem. Uh, for uh, expressibility of the model, and it's related also to the to the last one, um, because um, we would we would like to have a, a way to to be able to 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 move between rules uh, in a more soft way, right? And the last one is because of these uh, hard boundaries that you have, uh, the model only uh, can have uh, two to the air, uh, different outcomes, wherever is the number of rules. So if your model has, for example, in the previous example, eight rules, uh, the model can only produce two to the eight, which is one and uh, 28, right? Uh, or two, two, 56, I don't know, but uh, different outcomes, right? You cannot be able to generate another outcome of uh, using these rules. Um, because we are finally uh, the discretizing the input space to the to com uh, complain to a rule or not. So you have uh, this uh, also this limitation, and this limitation doesn't uh, happen in other models like in artificial neural networks, where you can multiply, for example, values, real values, floating numbers, and obtain any any um, uh, other value. Uh, but you would have this limitation in, for example, in random forest uh, algorithms. They, they, they have also this, this uh, problem. But uh, we have possible improvements for these problems. And these are the three ones that I would like to, <laughs> to implement, but uh, because of time and, uh, and time, basically, I didn't. So, but uh, we can try. For example, the first one is to address the, um, the uncertainty problem, that we only have one uh, value for the uncertainty. Uh, we can explore using all the subsets, but in order to do that uh, in a realistic way, we need to use approximation algorithm for computing the, the Dempster rule, for example, or the combination of the mass. Um, because if we use just the formula uh, that the, the Dempster-Sheffer theory proposed, it will be 
very, very slow, right? So we need to address this with approximation algorithms. Uh, the second one is to, um, to soften this, um, this rule behavior. And we propose uh, like a metric of degree of belonging to a rule. Uh, today we have like uh, a record has, uh, a rule is true for a record or not, yeah? It's like binary. We have two possible uh, options there. But we can uh, extend that to a degree of belonging. So if you have one rule, we can say that a record has this rule with a degree of 0 0.1, for example. And then you can have a um, more soft way to move between having a rule and not having a rule. Uh, this will increase the performance of the model um, um, because we uh, have run some experiment on that. But we need to, uh, to somehow uh, put this in the optimization uh, method also. The, the degree of belonging have to be a function that can be compute the derivative to, to the uh, optimization model, uh, for the optimization model to work, right? So it's not so easy, but it could be a great improvement, especially in performance of the model. And the last one is to, to address the problem of uh, having the, the rules defined in the beginning. Uh, we can uh, let the model to drop rules or combine rules in the training phase, right? If the model, um, if after some iteration, the some rule is always decreasing in the certainty, increasing in uncertainty, that rule may be not informative, right? And we can drop them. And if one rule is very correlated with another rule, so that uh, every one, every iteration that this rule in increases some values, this also, this do also, uh, we can combine them, right? Um, these are two other options to drop rules and uh, generate less rules. And if we have less rules, we can put in the beginning more rules uh, because it will not uh, increase the training time, right? So these are three of the main improvements that can be uh, done to the model and um, um, maybe in the future uh, releases of the model, uh, these improvements will be implemented. So that's, that's the idea. Because we would like to, for example, also to learn the rule uh, in, in a certain way. For example, if we have the same example as I said before, if you have a, a uh, a page and age, for example, greater than 20 or something, uh, you would like to be able to change the value of 20, right? And put this as a uh, parameter of the model. And to do that, if you like to be this value to be a parameter, you need to be able to compute the gradient all the way to this value. Yes. Yes, because now if you remember in the last lecture, we have a, a method called select rules or something like that, that we use if a statement to, to know if some rule applies or not, right? If an if is not uh, something that we can differentiate to, to find a, a, a gradient. So if you change that with a function, right, uh, you can apply the differentiation to the condition. Yeah. So this is the, the idea with the degree of belonging. Yeah, so these are uh, improvements that uh, we will be working on and uh, we hope that in the next iteration of the model they will be uh, developed, right? Uh, moving to the extension of the Dempster Shepherd classifier, uh, so far we are only talking about classification, right? But uh, the other uh, main task of supervised learning is regression. And uh, for regression task, it's not so clear or not so uh, straight how to 
uh, use the Dempster Sheffer classifier to produce a value, a real value in a, in a non constrained uh, domain, right? Uh, in the other case, you have the frame of discernment, this, like the possible outcomes or the Dempster Sheffer, and you see a, a one to one mapping from these outcomes to the classes of the classification problem. But in the case of regression, it is not so clear how to uh, use these uh, Dempster Sheffer masses and all this stuff to, to produce a value, a target value uh, uh, that a regression needs. But we have explored two different um, methods that, um, that I will present here to address this problem, right? The first one is this one, which is the embedded interpretable regressor. Yeah, and the idea is to uh, create an embedded model. An embedded model is when you com combine more or one uh, models and uh, the idea is to have first the Dempster uh, Sheffer classifier, the same classifier uh, as we have seen, and then a regressor, any regressor. Could be gradient boosting, even a linear regressor, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and the idea is to, uh, you have the target value ranges, yeah, for example, from zero to, to 10, yeah. This is the range of the, the, the values the, um, um, of the target, right? And you can uh, create groups uh, with this variable. For example, if the uh, target value is less than two, you assign one class, like the lowest, the low class. If the value is between two and five, you assign another class, five to seven, another, and seven and te to 10. Uh, another class. So you discretize the target value uh, to have like these uh, classes. And then uh, if you have this class, these classes, uh, you can apply the Dempster Sheffer classifier to, to them, right? You have a classification problem now. Um, and if you apply the Dempster Sheffer classification model to these uh, like um, groups of target values, uh, you will find the, the classification, right, all the stuff, and also the interpretability for each group, right? So we uh, should have the most important rules, for example, for the lowest values of the target, uh, and the same for the mid values and for the higher values. So uh, we can uh, have the interpretability uh, from these groups, right? It's an approximation, of course, but it, it will work, and um, after that, we can apply a regressor um, to each group, right? We divide this group into, into four, right? And we train a regressor in this subset, and in this subset, and, and so on. So we have like four uh, regressors, uh, one for each group, and the regressor a task is to predict the value, and the classifier task is to produce the interpretability, right? So we combine the classification with uh, several regressors to produce uh, a target value and an interpretability result here. So that's the idea of the embedded interpretable regressor, and um, we actually have an implementation for that that I would like to uh, show to you. Yeah. So, uh, similar to the classification uh, model, we have uh, this embedded interpretable regressor in a package uh, from Python. Uh, first, we need to install the classification because it's a dependency of the regressor. Um, and then um, the regressor. Yeah, the regressor is also in a GitHub repository. Uh, publicly available, this is not so, uh, um, it has not a, a, a good readme, but the, the documentation inside is okay. So you can check that. Um, yeah, so uh, we need to, in order to use it in, in the collab, we need to clone the repository. Yeah, and for this example, we'll be using a, a, a toy data set. This is the, 
uh, insurance uh, data set that uh, has some uh, variables about the, the uh, a patient, right? Uh, like the age, the uh, sex, the body mass index, and so on. And it, this last value, which is our target, is the charge of the insurance. Yeah, and we would like to, to predict this value and also uh, have interpretable results about the, this prediction of the, of the data set, right? We can make some charts just to see the, the, um, the data. We have like 1,300 uh, records, right? The, well, the age is balanced, the all, all uh, attribute the charts are not so balanced, but that's not an issue, right? So for, for this problem, we will be applying the same methodology as before. We will be splitting the data set into a training set and a testing set. In this case, we are using 33% of the data set to the testing set. Um, okay, so we have, for example, here our training uh, features, right? They are all numerical because we are applying this uh, get dummies function there, which uh, converts categorical uh, features to numerical features. This is mainly uh, a limitation of the regressor because the classifier can handle categorical values. Uh, right, so here we have the, uh, the regressor, the embedded interpretable regressor, AI regressor, right? Uh, and if you look at the docs of this, uh, this class, you have that you, uh, you need to pass a regressor model first, then you pass the parameters for that regressor, the number of buckets, that the number is, this is the uh, how many groups that you are dividing your target value to, uh, to perform the classification. Then uh, you need to pass the bucketing method, uh, how these uh, groups will be created. We have uh, different uh, alternatives. For example, range means that uh, the value is split evenly uh, with the range values, with the, with the target values, I mean. The quantile uh, is the splits are ensure that every a group has the same number of record, and the max score uh, maximizes the sum of the target in each group. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, arguments for the regressor and arguments for the classifier. So we can see here how to use it. We need to import the embedded interpretable regressor, and we also need to import one a regressor that that you know that you use. For example, here. We are using gradient boosting regressor, but you can use linear regression, a random forest regressor, uh, anyone that uh, has the, uh, the fit predict interface uh, will work here. So after um, having a regressor, we need to instantiate this uh, embedding interpretable regressor. We need to pass the regressor that we are using and um, and we can pass some arguments for the regressor. These are arguments for this uh, regressor. Then the arguments for the bucketing. Here we are using three buckets with the quantile uh, strategy. And then these are uh, parameters for the classifier, right? The number of iterates and the loss function, the learning rate, all this uh, stuff, right? So we can uh, instantiate this, and then uh, it uh, is used like a normal uh, model with the fit predict uh, methods. The fit uh, do, does the training. So here the, the classifier is being trained, also the regressors for each group um, we have here the rules strategies, like we said 
we see before. And okay, it, it fit the, the classifier and the regressor. Um, for predictions, you only need to do the predict um, method here over the testing set. And there we have the uh, white bread. So if we see that, uh, we see that uh, um, each uh, record in the testing set is being assigned to one value. And this is, these are uh, real numbers, right? Not, not classes, as before. So uh, we can see the metrics of these models. Uh, now that we have a regression model, we have new metrics for regression, like the R square uh, and the uh, mean absolute error. So if we test that, we see that the regressor uh, has an R square of 20, oops, I don't know what happened. Okay, <laughs> so the regressor has an R square of 84, right, which is high, and a mean, score, mean absolute error of um, 1,700, uh, right? Uh, these are the metrics for the regressor, for the full regressor, the embedded regressor, that has all the buckets and, and groups uh, internally, but we can see the classifier also. The classifier produced this confusion matrix, as you can see. Uh, this is the, and this is the accuracy. Yeah, and the F1 score, I guess. Um, so the classifier achieves 78% um, of accuracy. That's good, not so good. And the interesting thing of this embedding uh, interpretable regressor model is that uh, it doesn't depend much on the classification accuracy because after that you have another regressor that can fix the, the problems or the accuracy problems of, of the classifier. So even if this value is not so high, uh, it can achieve high values for uh, regression metrics, right? And, the, and all of this is uh, for finding the most important rules for each class. So here we have, for example, uh, the same method as, uh, as the classifier has, the print most important rules, and we can uh, see which are the most important rules for all of these three buckets, the class zero, one, and two. And uh, zero is the lowest uh, class, so the, the, um, this is the group with the lowest target value, so with the lowest income, or uh, charges of insurance, right? And we can see the rules that it produces. For example, uh, this tell us that uh, people who doesn't smoke, right? With smoke, yes, is zero, doesn't smoke, uh, pay low in, in insurance. Also, uh, young people, people who doesn't have children, uh, young people again, uh, and so on. So the rules, a kind of makes sense for this class. If we see the other uh, one, for example, the class that pays the most, which is the uh, class two, we see that there are uh, people with a lot of children, four children, right? Uh, two or three, right? Are people that are at all, and people that smoke, and, and so on. So we can see that uh, it makes sense, and uh, and we can uh, achieve this kind of interpretability for a regression even if we are grouping uh, the records to um, to apply the classifier. So this is a, in, an interesting trick, and it works sometimes. Uh, so this is one of the uh, main ways to apply, to, to have a regression task uh, and interpretability, like, like before. So, um, uh, yeah, this is the, the regressor. So you will have this implementation also if you want to apply to a regression problem. Uh, that's uh, okay. So if we move to the presentation again, 
Uh, this is not the only uh, regression model that we uh, have uh, tested or done. Another one is the uh, this one, which is called the weight in evidential interpretable regression. Yeah, this is an extension of another method that uh, it's called evidential interpretable regressor that uh, uses a combination of the k nearest neighbors uh, regressor with them search effort theory. Yeah, and the way it does is like um, finding the the k neighbors to a record, right? Uh, and use their target values to um, to produce the value of the prediction that we are looking for, right? But instead of taking the average or or make a, a make them both or something like that, uh, the model proposes a custom Dixon function, right? Which assign uh, different weights to each uh, dimension, so you can, for example, shrink one dimension or extend another. Uh, and this, the distance will change, of course. And also, uh, the distances are not computed as like the two-point distance, safely and distance that we, we know. They are um, evidence of the Dempster Shepherd theory. So if I have one neighbor that is close to me, according to the Euclidean distance uh, function, we say that we are certain to that this uh, record is uh, similar to what I want, right? I, and if I have a record that is far from the, um, from the record that I am predicting, uh, it has a, a high inter uncertainty, right? And we pass this to a mass assign functions, we apply the Dempster rule, and then we average or we took the, the average or some function to compute the target value. So we apply uh, two different things. Uh, one is uh, the, this uh, weight of the dimensions that are parameters of the model, by the way. So they are learned by gradient descent, of course, like in the previous example. And then we have this, like, uh, them search effort decision to, to produce the target value, right? Uh, this model, unfortunately, has only local and group interpretability. It doesn't have global interpretability. Uh, so this is the main limitation of this, this model. But we have applied this model uh, to some uh, application. One is, for example, to predict healthcare costs, like in the, in the example that I showed you before. And it can predict um, can produce good results in performance, as you can see in this table. Uh, it achieves, uh, it outperforms gradient boosting and, um, and some uh, artificial neural network architectures uh, with a better R square, for example, and a, and a lower uh, mean absolute error. And it can produce these rules that doesn't apply to the full data set, but can uh, give us insights about the, 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 the data. Yeah, and another application of this ah, that I didn't mention is that the uncertainty that is computed in the Dempster Shepherd decision for the target value can be used also for uh, computing a confidence interval of the target value. So if we have high uncertainty, we have a, a, a greater a confidence interval of if have low uncertainty, we have a, a, a lower a conf, a confidence interval too. And we applied this, for example, for predicting a retail indicators uh, in Chile. Uh, for example, conversion rates, sales, or the number of visitors of one store. So, and it worked well. Here is a, a chart that uh, shows the actual value and the predicted value, and it it worked well, right? Uh, so this method is uh, more complicated than the previous one, so I can show you in real uh, action, but it also, it's also available um, publicly, so you can fork and, and use. Yeah, another use of Dempster Sheffer that is not 
Uh, regression is a classification or again, but in other contexts, not tabular data set that uh, we are working before. Uh, this is the Dempster Sheffer for geographical uh, data. And we have proposed a way to handle this uh, type of data set using Dempster Sheffer. Uh, uh, first, uh, geographical data set are the ones that has a latitude and longitude in some of the attributes, right? And you can put them in a map. So, uh, what is uh, usually um, the task is to to produce a value that depends on these coordinates also, right? So um, one of the important things or changes that we made to the model to handle this um, uh, geographical data is to associate the distance with the evidence, similar to, to the previous one. So if we have some event or some record from the training set that happens in a, in a place, and we are predicting a value uh, near to this place, so we uh, can state that this um, value is informative, has a few um, uh, or lower uh, uncertainty, right? And if we are uh, far, we have a high uncertainty, similar to, to the k nearest neighbor uh, strategy, but we use it in here, in the uh, geographical data set. And um, the, the other important thing about geographical data set is that uh, they can be um, augmented uh, using public data set, right? If we are, for example, predicting something that is happening here in Yerevan, we can use the public information about where are the restaurants, where are the bus stops, where are the banks, and this can be put as evidence to the model or as rules, for example, uh, so the model can decide if they are informative or not, yeah? And we have a, a way to combine this uh, geographical information uh, or evidence with the Dempster rule and produce some output. Uh, in this case, for example, we apply uh, the dempster Sheffer uh, geographical to predicting crime occurrences, right, uh, in, in Chile. Uh, we work with the police there, and we uh, apply this model to, for example, a region or a, a certain uh, quarter of the city. Uh, they would like to know which are the hotspots of uh, or the places that are more likely to, to cure crime, to they be there right? um, prevent them. So we train this model and and apply all the methodology I said, and the output is like a, a heat map that tells us where are the most likely spots for, for crime occurrence. Yes, and we can check with these stars uh, that are from the, the testing set that our uh, predictions were uh, right. We achieved like 80% uh, of accuracy or something like that. Uh, so this is one of uh, the applications that uh, we uh, developed for uh, the Dempster Sheffer Geographical uh, version, right? So yeah, and as you can see, you can uh, extend this model to regression to another type of classification that are not tables. Uh, but there is another way to use Dempster Sheffer that is like a not uh, in the model itself, but in the decision uh, after the, the results of the model. So, um, as you can, uh, as you all have noticed, uh, the dempster Sheffer theory is, to, is for decision making. Yeah? You have evidence, you have uncertainty, and you can make a decision with that uh, following the procedure. So, one uh, thing that we can do is uh, for any task, we ask uh, the existing model to, to solve the task, right? For example, if we have a, a regression, a, a classification, anything, or we ask different model to, to solve the task. And we 
what we typically do is to compare these models and find the best one, and, and we took the best one, uh, the best one, and we deploy them, right? But another thing that you can do with this result of the model is to say that uh, this model is giving me evidence about the result of the task that I'm like to solve, and this evidence can be combined uh, using the dem search effort theory, right? So uh, if the model one gives me a result, for example, uh, it, in a classification problem, the model one says that the class one is the, is the one for this record and has these probabilities distributed. We can convert them to a mass assigned function, assigning an uncertainty for the model, depending on what the model, uh, the result of the model. And we can uh, do the same for the model two and the model three. So if we have, for example, here, uh, gradient boosting, uh, an artificial neural network, and support vector machine, anything that give me the same outcome or, or, uh, or, this, or different result, but for the same problem, we can uh, transform these results to mass assigned functions, combine them using Dempster rule. So we have a mass for a combination and then uh, provide a result. That is the combination of the three first models. So uh, we are using here, like I said, the Dempster Shepherd theory to make a decision on which model uh, is better uh, for each uh, record. Right? And this is very simple. You can code this um, and you can use it, for example, to, to, to have a better model. And usually this strategy works uh, better than picking the best model in the first place. Right? And this is something really <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so you can use the Dempster Sheffer theory not to build models, but to uh, use the result of models as well. Right? So, uh, well, that ends us the, this, uh, today's presentation. The last uh, things that I would like to share are the articles and papers that uh, explain all of these uh, models that I presented in this presentation and the previous one. We have, uh, they are all uh, published in, in articles, so you can check them. Uh, there are many ones, so you have something to, to read, right? Um, and that's it.